dogs can smell parts per trillion. They can smell cancer. They can smell if you're going to have a seizure. It's not just between a dog and another dog. It's across species. Is it fear as we understand it that they're working on? Their behaviour is changing based on how a human yeah. is feeling yeah. and how they're smelling it. The human's not even there. Where do we draw the line? How far can we take it? Hi, I'm Dr. Sab Cohen-Hatton and I'm a neuroscientist specialising in animal and human learning mechanisms. And I'm Jamie Penrith, I specialise in canine predatory behaviour and I'm a former police dog handler. And I'm Danny Wells and I'm a dog trainer specialising in unwanted behaviour and it sounds a lot less impressive than the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> and every week we sit down to talk about the latest research in canine psychology. And more importantly, how you can apply it to your own dog to get to know them a bit better. Welcome to The Dog Scholar. Right, what are we going to talk about this week? What are we going to talk oh, about well, this week, Well, I will tell you. Um, I'd guess it'd say some science. <laughs> <laughs> right, I've got a question. Go on. Can dogs da -da -da, smell fear? Smell fear? fear. Yeah. They probably smell my fear. I've got terrible bowels today, man. <laughs> In a bad I way. wouldn't call that fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're a bit fearful fear. of it. I've got the videos of Jamie's approving. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a taxi so with him. In, yeah. Well, in the car on the way, <laughs> yeah. dear listeners, unfortunately, whatever fear came over Danny nearly asphyxiated the rest yeah. of us travelling in the We're car. The I may share that video on my socials once this episode goes live. <laughs> well, I'm just glad there isn't television. Yeah. Anyway, that's we all. drift away from the question. Yes! <laughs> Listen, dog success in living with us has depended for thousands of years on their increased social attention towards us. And we know that smell is one of dogs' most powerful senses. So can they smell fear, or happiness for that matter? Can they smell um, our mood? Given, given that dogs can smell parts per trillion without even looking at the science, I'd say, yeah, we secrete many different pheromones, hormones, everything when we're in different states. I'd say that we're probably going to give a bit of a whiff, aren't we? Well, that must have been awful for the dogs in the car, in all seriousness, coming in then. Yeah, because they like smelly stuff as well. Your dog rolls around and fuck it to them. My shit must be blissful. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> 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 I, I think I think you, what you're saying is right. You know, my, for for my sort of like input on it, I would say that yeah, yeah. I do think dogs can de uh, yeah. detect a shift in, you know, a shift in mood based on a shift in odor and mm, yeah. linking that with the behaviour yeah. changes in the person. You know, I mean, many ma like... many a time I can picture Wade next to me going like <laughs> himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it'd be rightly so. <laughs> I certainly know that from a from a, a police dog handling point of view, you know, back, back when uh, working those and with, with the training of those as well is it was a very different um, set of circumstances when you set up, uh, you know, a, d teaching the dog to track uh, a criminal who is yeah. actually, you know, one of your colleagues who's laid the track for them and provides the, the bite reward at the end of it, uh, compared to when you've actually got a live job and you've mm. got somebody who is pumping out adrenaline and argu yeah, yeah. arguably fear and any other scent yeah, that goes yeah. with it and the switch you know anybody who's worked uh, dogs in operational situations will be able to say the switch in drive the switch in motivation mm. yeah, you know yeah. for those dogs when it's actually real when it's live mm -hmm. you can see that dog come alive yeah. and so there's got to be a reason for that there's got to be a reason for it uh, obviously jamie i am uh, safe as a police officer i've only trained dogs to track you know recreationally would you say there's a difference in when you're tracking them on concrete where they're looking for more people or compared to when they're in grass and they're looking more at broken vegetation could you can you see a difference in the drive pickle yeah you do can yeah you? because obviously you get you know the 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 better the vegetation, the, the yeah. greater the ground disturbance, the greater the scent, the greater yeah, the, you know, yeah. the olfactory ability. And so the more drive kicks in with a dog. Obviously, yeah. I'm working a little bit harder when I start yeah. moving across hard, hard surfaces. Hard yeah. surfaces. But they're looking more for the person then, aren't they? The smell's yeah. coming more for the person. So can you see an, an elevating arousal levels like, oh. It depends whether or not you're coming towards the end of that track or whether yeah, you're yeah. part way through it. Obviously, the closer you get to the to the source, you know, the, yeah, to the target yeah. of the of the scent, yeah. then then obviously you'll see an increase there it's coming incredible. on. But is it fear? It's, is it's fear incredible that they're picking when up you on? think about the way that the dogs sense the world. You know, yeah. the, the 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 number of nerve endings that they have in their olfactory system is just immense. So we take our kind of primary view of the world from things that we can see and things mm. that we can hear. Right? They almost see the world in smell i can't i can't even you begin can't. to describe no, you it how would you it's you're like talking, to, you? to like I said, you're, you're talking yeah. parts per trillion so to put that into context for the for the listeners you're talking a dog can smell one single drop of blood in two olympic-sized swimming pools that is phenomenal 
That's incredible. Absolutely phenomenal. That's it. They must hate going through the perfume section in a department store. I do myself. I think <laughs> I might be sort of similar. Yeah. That's that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That is you a good point. Yeah, 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 yeah. And people who've got homes where they have plug-in diffusers. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. So many issues for dogs then plug-in yeah, right. yeah. So many different things where you're overwhelming that, that sensory capacity. And you imagine yeah. if, if our, ours is our, you know, our principal sort of like um, means of navigating around things would be sight, arguably. Yeah. You know, imagine if you were flooding that. Yeah. with competing um, you know distractions it's phenomenal isn't it yeah so do you want to know what the science says go on Always. let's do it, wow. Always. Bring it in. i found one study it was really interesting actually it exposed dogs to human sweat or more specifically the chemo signals or chemical messengers in it to see how smelling that sweat or smelling those chemo signals affected their behavior now the sweat was harvested from people after they'd been made to watch videos that either made them really happy or really scared. <laughs> so was, they had to wear these absorbent pads underneath their armpits <laughs> while they were watching this. Um, so it absorbed all the sweat and then that went off to the lab. Now they took pads from three different people to and put them together to make a super sweat pad. <laughs> mm. Pit pongs. Nice. Pit pongs, yeah. Um, but there was a reason for that. It was to try to reduce the risk of individual differences. So rather than just smelling a person, an individual person, they wanted them to be able to smell uh, a kind of multitude of things that represented the same thing. So kind of trying to make it as broad Something, as possible, yeah. to generalise. So this is generally what a frightened, sweaty person smells like. This is generally what a happy person smells like. Now, the dogs were then brought into a room and their owner was sitting in the one corner and diagonally opposite, so you imagine a square room, um, was a stranger. Now, neither the owner or the stranger were allowed to make eye contact with each other or with the dogs or interact with the dogs. And in the middle of the room was this little container and it had loads of air, oh, air holes in it and it had the sweaty super pads in there. Now, when the dogs could smell fear sweat, they showed more signs of stress and they were more likely to go back to their owner for some comfort. They did this with bitches and dogs to see if there were any differences in the in the in the sex of the dogs. And bitches showed stronger avoidance behaviour than dogs. So they were more likely to head to the door to try to get away from whatever the the fright. It's very, very was. interesting. Yeah. Really now, interesting. A similar sex difference has been seen in other species too, in response to things that are that are fearful. But when they were exposed to happy sweat, is that a thing? Yeah, happy yeah. sweat, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We won't go into that on this episode. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> this is a family show. <laughs> where, where are you going to on about that? Yeah. <laughs> but when they were exposed to happy sweat, the bitches were also more likely to interact with a stranger instead of their owner. Mm. And that was something that male dogs didn't do. Some of the, um, the more mainstream bite sports the vast majority, I couldn't put a percentage on, but I'd say it's high 90s. There's only a few bitches that go through that. They mainly put male dogs through that. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. there's some other research that looks at that, and it found that one of the biggest indicators for how successful dogs will be at that kind of work um, is uh, on a personality inventory, their boldness scores. Yeah. Boldness, not boldness, yeah, yeah. boldness. So, you know, my naked dog wouldn't bold be much they are. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Smash it but they? yeah, but what they found was that male dogs are more likely to be bold than female dogs but when you got a bold female dog it was as good as mm. the bold male dog so it was just a, a percentage might want to say male pattern boldness <laughs> <laughs> indeed indeed but, um, but it is you know it is something interesting now what we couldn't tell from this study was whether those sex differences in that kind of emotional expressivity happened because the bitches and the dogs had a different perception of the emotion through its senses. And so they responded differently because they were experiencing it differently or whether it was because they genuinely felt differently about it. Now we know that in humans, the chemo signals, those chemical messengers that you have mm. in your can, Sorry, Sab, can you just go into a bit more detail for the people mm. at home? What, what is and the chemo signals? How does <laughs> it work? It's basically... I, I, I act like I know this, but we, we, we had a briefing before and she let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, the chemo signal is basically a chemical messenger that you secrete in your sweat. So it's something that you can kind of, you might smell. And when you, when you smell that, it induces something called a simulacrum. Now, a simulacrum is just a really big word for a mental representation. So you smell it and you imagine something. And in this case, the simulacrum is the emotional state of the person sweating. Mm. So in your mind's eye, Mimicking. yeah, in your mind's eye, you smell this 
and in your mind's eye, you almost feel how that person must be feeling okay. as a result of smelling the, the almost cumulus. almost like being with someone who's extremely stressed, and then you over start sudden start yeah. feeling stressed, but through exactly a, that a, a, um, a, a smell okay. exactly yeah. that. There's a kind of synchrony in their wow. in their brains that are driven by detecting these chemo signals, and we know that happens in humans. But here, this study is showing that dogs are capable of the same simulacrum, that same mental representation. But it's not just between a dog and another dog. It's across species. Yeah, they're smelling again, phenomenal. Yeah. Human, yeah, they're smelling human moods and essentially having some kind of simulacrum, arguably, as a result of that. Yeah. Their behaviour is changing based on how a human yeah. is feeling it, it, and how they're smelling. The human's not even there. It just blows me away that, you know, it, 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 it makes sense because you're talking about, you know, a social animal, uh, you know, a pack animal, if, mm. if you will, that that would be kind of infectious so that everyone's getting the same feeling and is going to act accordingly as one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if if everyone's feeling differently, yeah. then you don't work in, in cohesion, do you? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it, isn't Mother Nature just amazing the way things like that work? It's, but it's like, it's like even with atoms and molecules and the way that if one gets heated up, everything else kind of heats yeah, up to yeah, that yeah, they're yeah, all yeah, at the same yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh my God, in it's sync, basically yeah. physics in your dog's brain. You know, we don't know. Like we, we, we're thinking that it means that the dog can smell fear yeah, or something yeah. like that but is it you know is it is it fear as we understand it that they're working on or is it something like like you say if you if you're talking in such um or or talking about such an ability you know to to detect scent at such minute yeah. you know um quantities then maybe it's something beyond what we're even capable maybe of. Smelling yeah. something that we're not even detecting. Yeah, that right. we haven't even got a word yeah, for, that yeah. we don't have an understanding yeah, yeah. of. You don't know. We're assuming that they're smelling fear and then feeling fear, but of yeah. course it could be that they're smelling fear and they're re they're recalling an association between a person and that smell, a frightened yeah, person yeah. and that smell, the way that frightened person behaved and that smell, and whatever associations they've got based on their behaviour yeah. as a result. So they might not be feeling fear, but they might be responding to how you behave when you're afraid. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. But either way, there is something there, isn't there, about how your mood can be driving your dog's behaviours. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah, we it see does. it all the time. Yeah, we pet do. behavior, don't we? Yeah. yeah, we do. So if you're working your dog when you're happy, then your chemo signals might be putting your dog in a more relaxed state, right? But if you're working your dog when you're stressed, you know, and you do see that, don't you, with reactive dogs? When the owner's going out, the owner's worried and the owner's stressed, then the dog is picking up on that. You put the dog away. Yeah. Don't you? It's yeah, never, yeah, it's, and we always advise this, don't we? It's yeah, never yeah. a good idea to train your dog when you're stressed. Yeah. No, it isn't. No, so it there's isn't. something about being self-aware in this as well, isn't it? So there you have it. Dogs can very literally smell your mood. Who knew? However it's represented within the dog's mind, within the dog's brain, is kind of secondary because the point is they can discriminate between the moods and behave differently mm. accordingly and in a consistent way. And in theory then, if that's the case, then you should be able to counter condition it. You should be able to subject them to some sort of, you know, stressful sweat and produce a reward as right. a result of that and counter condition the whole feeling around it. Yeah, so yeah. it smells the it smells the stress sweat and, and then it, something instead good it expects something good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that'll go down to the dog's life experiences yeah. as well. Now, I will I will say though, obviously there's there's always room for further exploration, but out of all of the um the literature we've gone this through so cool far, this is the one that's really getting me as a dog trainer thinking I can see this because we know dogs can smell parts per trillion. They can smell cancer. They can smell if you're going to have a seizure. Yeah. So it would, you know, we know that we secrete different hormones and things when we are stressed or fearful or happy. So I think Why it's well within the realm to. of possibility that the dog can, yeah, can pick I up Yeah, I guess on it's that. whether or not they interpret it as yeah. how we interpret it. So yeah, they yeah. see that as being fear or they yeah. see, as opposed yeah. to and just a shift in what you I'm know, picking what, up. What happens, what happens with like, in the case of singular learning events, so a, a singular learning event for the people at home, something that happens that has a detrimental outcome on a dog's behavior, how they how they relate to what, what has just happened. So for example, It's you like know, a really bad yeah, experience. You've just got the, you've just got the job of your dreams, yeah. you've just got engaged, you've got a brand new car, you take the dog for a walk, and something really bad happens and, and, and the dogs now, is that all that smell of happiness now equated with a singular learning event? Uh, you know, yeah. 
Yeah. They're associative yeah. learners. Yeah. Where, where do we draw the line? How far can we take it? Do you get me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah, I do. But it is, I mean, there is that huge complexity of signals that dogs are picking up on all the time. So we know that they're amazing at reading people. We know that they've got parts of their brain that are dedicated to reading faces, for yeah. example, for processing faces. So they're constantly attuned to your, you know, your, the expressions that you have on your face. They're constantly attuned to, yeah, that expression that Danny just pulls. No, I missed it. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was, he'd get number one in the gurning contest in Cornwall for that, I reckon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so they're constantly reading us. They're reading our body language. And then you throw in those chemo signals as well. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show how attuned they are to us. No wonder they've evolved alongside us for thousands of mm -hmm. years and done so really successfully. Yeah. We also have a greater capacity than we give ourselves credit for. I think we become reliant on um, simpler, more basic, you know, um, cues and signals because you can walk into a situation or you can walk down a street that you've never been down before and you get a feeling. Yeah. What mm -hmm. you describe as, I, I had, it gave me this feeling yeah, or yeah. a person and something about that person projects something. Now there's no, there's no prior learning, but yeah. something is given off. But are we actually capable of doing more than we realize that we are, but we've just lost the capacity to be able to understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Do we have a spidey yeah. sense that we've there never you known? Go. Well, spidey yeah. senses. A lot of my human research was focused on the things that bias the way that we make decisions. So I looked at how Pavlovian associations, things that you become conditioned to. So, you know, if I was to always kind of see this pen uh, and at the same time, someone gives me chocolate, I'm going to have a Pavlovian association between this pen and some chocolate. That's the thing that I'm always going to link it to. Um, and instrumental processes. So if I, every time I pressed a button, then someone brought me some chocolate, then I'd have an association between that response and the outcome of chocolate. But those things that we learn can interact with each other. And sometimes the things that we're experiencing, the, those parts of the jigsaw, are just a cue that have been previously paired with something else. So when we have a kind of gut feeling that something might be going wrong, it's usually because there's a cue, there's something that we've previously experienced that's signaling that. And I mean, it could be the same with dogs. And you know, coming to the, the point about the chemo signals and the, and the mood, it might not be a really innate thing that they smell fear and they naturally think that something bad is going to happen. It could very well be linked to previous associations that they've made with something, whether a, a single singular learning event, for example, yeah. or whether it's something more broad that's happened repeatedly. So yeah. every time I see my, my owner or my handler feeling afraid, something bad happens. So I'm going to preserve myself and run to the door yeah. or I'm going to feel stressed and I'm going to yeah. seek comfort from my from my uh, my handler or my owner. You know, it, it can be down to that level as well. And again, that's something that similar with all of the studies that we're looking at, it's really hard to deduce because we can only read the dog's behavior. We can only measure the dog's behavior. Internal we can't ask external. them questions. Yeah, yeah. So we don't know what they're thinking necessarily. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and is it that I'm, you know, on that, is it that I'm smelling fear or is it that I'm just picking up some kind of signal mm. that says to me, avoid, yeah. move away from, you know, whether it's yeah. some, some kind it, of innate pre-programming, yeah, yeah. you know, who knows? Yeah, and it's important to remember that, you know, we know this through behavior modification that we can we can constantly evolve their associations, we can, we can change them, we can, we can, you know, we can play around with that as well. I wonder whether dogs are also smelling chemo signals from other dogs. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, I don't know why my dog just reacted to that particular dog. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like a dog that they've had a previous, you know, they've, they've not had a Barney before with yeah. a, you know, with a miniature schnauzer, but for some reason that dog didn't move, but for some reason my dog really reacted to that and I've got no idea why. Now, there might have been a multitude of things that happened that we're not and necessarily and noticing. And then you take, the, they take them there to see what's going on and yeah, that other dog yeah. just happens to be stood there yeah. like this. Looking at the dog, it's okay. It's friendly. Oh, I, think, I think I know why he's reacting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it could be that they're smelling chemo signals. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe well, so. Yeah, maybe you know? so. Very could be something that you know because I I've heard a lot of people say well perhaps it's pheromones well perhaps it is but perhaps there's also some chemo signals that are giving the dog an indication of that dog's mood and then it's prompting it or preempting a response a particular response from that dog. Do you think it's anything you'll ever know? Oh, oh there's always science is, yeah, science yeah. is always yeah, yeah, evolving, yeah, yeah. and I'm sure we'll course, find out one day. But there's a study in everything. Yeah, there's a study in everything. Yeah. I think it's important to take from that that you that you, you, your dog is learning twenty four seven. So it's mm. important to think how are you interacting with your dog all the time? What kind of moods are you in? Is is your dog your your way of um? Uh, is your dog a coping strategy for for struggles at home? Whether yeah. it be 
depression or domestic violence, how, what, how will that shape your dog's behavior in the future? Depending on what mood are you in when you're spending time with the dog? I think there's so many questions we can ask from that, isn't there? There's something as well about when dogs are puppies, how that kind of behavior, that experience, imprints on them from a really young age and so mm. if you get a puppy um because you're feeling really low like you might just have lost a dog and you want to go yeah. out and get another dog straight away but you're still feeling low see it all does the time that yeah. does it yeah. do you yeah I see it all the time with young dogs people trying to replace one with the other and um they're not ready for it they're still grieving the other dog they pull the heart into it and you got to remember you know from zero to 15 weeks is a puppy's crucial socialization yeah, period they're very very impressionable yeah and um and if you're if you're grieving and not leaving that dog be and pouring your heart into it, you're instilling a lot of you know anxieties in that yeah. dog from a very young age, yeah. and that could all be that could that could not just be behavioural, that that could be you know scent related, couldn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. Which isn't would be it? associative, wouldn't it? The yeah, way that all you're feeling and the, yeah. the and the negative yeah. states that you have yeah, and yeah. The, the associations that the dog, you know, the young pup yeah. makes. In, and now you know you you think I'm ready to start training, but the reality is you've al you've already kind of started your your run uphill. You know yeah. what I mean? You've you, you've not hit the ground running, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And there's there is something, isn't there, about how you how you can inoculate your dog around stress. Oh yeah. You know how I love that. how you I love can that have yeah, yeah how you can have coping strategies so that you make sure that your drama doesn't become your dog's drama as yeah. well, especially when they're not just picking up on you know your kind of verbal cues. But they're smelling you as well. That's a, that's you an know? interesting one. So when we, you know, if you can explain to the viewers at home about the process of myelination. Well, the more experiences that you have, the more of the same experience that you have, the stronger the connection between those things yeah. is, and that that just makes sense, right? The yeah. more times you do something, then you know, the kind of easier you'll do it because your brain kind of registers it, and you kind of start to do it automatically. You have a stronger link between those things, mm -hmm. and there's actual brain machinery that sits mm -hmm. behind that. So whenever you're doing that, your brain is making a connection so the synapses between the different neurons your different kind of brain cells well, are synapses. connecting with each other that it's the synapse is the connection between the two okay so it's the bit where two neurons meet essentially okay. so the more times that happens the more of this substance called myelin yeah. uh, you get that kind of ra it's a bit like um the best way to describe it is a bit like putting uh, insulation tape around yeah. a okay. wire yeah. so then you're keeping all of the electricity inside rather than losing some yeah. so it becomes a stronger connection it becomes a stronger yeah. bond so the more something's repeated yeah. the more myelin occurs yeah. and the stronger that connection yeah. is that's something I really work with when I'm dealing with dogs who are highly stressed but again there's a fine line between subjecting your dog to a limited amount of stress, allowing them to build resilience, to pushing them way too far too soon yeah. and flooding. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah well, quick. do you know what? We've talked a lot about the theory around this, but I think yeah. perhaps it's time we talked about some of the practice. So we'll be right back after the break with some practical tips, as well as some of our lovely listener questions. Welcome back. It's that part of the show when we look at what you can do practically with the research we've just learned about. Good stuff. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about the dog's stress, but I think it's very important to understand that usually what accompanies your dog's stress is the stress that you're incurring as well as a result of, you know, maybe being subjected to countless situations where your dog's choosing to aggress their way out of said stress. Briefly touched on myelination about building resilience to stress. I think a lot of dog trainers overlook the fact that they need to allow the owners to myelinate as yeah, well. Yeah. And what might be the starting point to your dog's stress? Yours might be a lot further. A, a lot further behind so you know when I've got clients who've got big powerful breeds and they're struggling part of getting them over that uh, their stress and and the dogs and, and we can do the dog in, in due course is just not subjecting them to stressful situations for a period of time let them reset let them mm. calm down a little bit decompression let, de time yeah decompression yeah. time but whilst but it's it's what I'd like to call de um, constructive decompression time so I'll give them homework to achieve, very realistic goals to achieve because they've literally subjected themselves to a year, maybe more, of constant failures, constant, oh God, this is going to happen. So they're not looking for how am I going to push my dog through this situation. They're going into a state of panic and having success with stress, whether you're a dog or a person, is about setting yourself small realistic goals and not failing. If you, ch if you set the goal on the bar too high and you fail, you just kill, your, kill yourself. You're just <laughs> kicking yourself over and over again. You need to subject yourself to some victories. Yeah, yeah and I, I think, like, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier on about the, the whole um, immunisation towards stress by yeah. 
putting yourself in mildly yeah. stressful situations or, or situations of adversity of some yeah. kind with an ability to be able to control them and to be able to get out of them. Obviously, when they're, you know, unpredictable and inescapable, you know, uncontrollable, that's when it, things become very, very yeah. difficult. Yeah. But where, the, where there is provision for that and you, you, you're making sure that you're not pushing person or dog over that threshold, you know, and so you're not entering fear where the dog isn't yeah. able to, if let's say that the dog is able to smell fear from the owner, that you're not actually putting n neither the owner nor the yeah. dog in that situation through that much, but you're actually developing confidence, yeah. do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. You're building them forward. But I, I, I think it's a it's a really valid point that because the, the, the behavior yeah. of the owner, whilst the dog may not, you know, it doesn't sort of like telegraph itself down through the lead towards the dog. But there is certainly this dynamic between both. If you get somebody, you know, they say that dogs can, can um, uh, uh, t tend to sort of like uh, be like their owners or yeah. owners be like their dogs, whichever way you look at it, you know? So a skitty sort of like giddy person has a sort of like skitty giddy dog and yeah. somebody who's timid and fearful has a dog that they need to keep away from everything and such and such, yeah. not all the time. But, yeah, yeah. you know, I think that, that there, there is, there's truth yeah. You know, or certainly elements of truth that are, that are founded in that. Well, yeah, I, I, 100%. And keeping on, on, on topic of, of fear, there is no point, really, if we're going off the grounds of, you know, the dog's most powerful sense is his nose. If you're attempting to subject your dog to minor stress, what you perceive as minor stress for them, but that is quite major stress for you, if they can smell that fear, yeah, surely you're yeah. kind of you know you you you're kind of on the on the back foot already. You you know the dog can't possibly allow that information to come in, register, myelinate, and and build resilience if it's too fixated. If if in fact your dog can smell your fear without you addressing your own fear first. Yeah, it's a different association, isn't well, it? Yeah. It might not be the yeah. one that we're trying to. But it's achieve. not an association it's you happening. can see. It could yeah. leave you with a big massive fat question mark and why is this not working when it has before? Yeah. Um, and it's something I learned, I probably started implementing maybe maybe six, seven years ago about really, I realised, you know, everyone in this industry is all the dog, the dog, the dog. We're there for the owners. Without them owners, them dogs can't improve. They live in a human world. There is no way for them to relate to the everyday social norms that we perceive as socially normal without having access to what is normal through their owner, yeah. through their handler. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it's just not just what's socially normal, is it? It's what's socially yeah. required, you know? Yeah. At the end, at the end of the day, you're bringing it... Because we're great at socially normal, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sticking to what's socially required. But, yeah. but it's, you know, yeah. it's a big ask. Yeah. It's a big ask that you're bringing a dog into, isn't yeah. it? You know, with legal limitations yeah. and social expectations. Yeah, and, and and yeah and that, which brings us back to, you know, training of terminal commands, things that you might like to do that, that de-stress you. But if you're having a really stressful day how is the learning process enjoyable for your dog if you're just teaching something as simple as down sit stand stay if you've had a really stressful day and you or you you're fearful of, of am i going to get sacked from my job tomorrow yeah is that impacting the joy that you bring into the moment of that learning experience for the dog i, th I think if nothing else if nothing else it impacts on the feeling that is generated as yeah. a result of that. Do you know what I mean? You you don't feel bad, yeah. go out and train a dog and feel good. No, Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. I, and, I, and I don't think the dog really gets anything yeah. of value from that either. So And we've we've hit on this before about um, controlling your environment. So let's say that you're trying to build up a, a, a confident response to the door going, but the dog has got a fearful response of strange people. Well, if you're putting all this time in, but leaving your dog to roam the house and they're getting to run to the door with a fearfully aggressive response, then they're never going to get over it because they're practicing that behavior again. So implement, uh, implementing a crate and a good, healthy routine of structure is going to 100% benefit you in that situation, isn't Let it? Let me jump in and be devil's advocate for yeah. what somebody who might say or might be thinking okay, who's yeah. listening or speaking or such and such. And it's not a crate, it's a cage. Oh, yeah. You're caging, you're caging yeah. your dog. Do you know well, what I mean? You're yeah, locking well, them up well, in a prison. Yeah, Tell news me about that. <laughs> news <laughs> flash, Shirley. So is your vet if your dog breaks its leg. So yeah. you better get your dog used to being in a confined space because if you're... If if you're going to move out the country, if your dog is really sick, has to have surgery for any reason, they're going to be in a crate. Right. But have you yeah. ever heard anyone tell someone off for putting their baby in a cot because it's a cage? Well, <laughs> I put mine in a crate, it was fine. I mean, <laughs> closing the bedroom door when you go to, to bed or to sleep yeah. or to whatever as a yeah, youngster. It's or, a or another, another, another thing that comes in handy with crate training, when you're dealing with dogs that have, you know, um, what would you say? let's say um, extreme levels of stress in, in, in an environment that shouldn't have any stress like your home. You're not yeah. really stressed if you're just chilling in bed. But let's say you brought in a dog from, from a, a, a shelter and you want them to relax in the home. A crate is a brilliant way to do it. When you put a dog in a, in a crate, not a massive crate where they can pace and get anxious, 
They can only really move so much before they relax and they calm and yeah. they lay down. Decompression, it's teaching them the, the subtle art of switching off from the world around them and relaxing. You put a fearful dog in a situation with space and they will pace that space. I'm a rapper, yeah? yeah they will, uh -huh. they will uh -huh. pace that space. Uh -huh. And the more they pace, they're on, they're, yeah, they're then... <laughs> they're, Other rappers are available. They're then... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> chocolate bar rapper. Um, if you're leaving a dog with too much space that's, you know, highly... Um, anxious and aroused at the same time, you, you're going to allow them to indulge in in a coping strategy for that for that arousal, which often is destructive behaviours, pacing, barking, you know, stuff that you don't want the dog to do. Once they're on that ladder of anxiety, it's only a ladder that's going to get, they're going to climb. They're not going to come back down my from it. My, my dogs, my dogs, <laughs> my yeah. dogs love the crate. It's um, it's a safe space for dogs. them. <laughs> I know. Yeah. My dogs love it. Uh, yeah, it's like yeah. a den. My dogs you know? do. Yeah. It's my like a den. Do, yeah, yeah. yeah it's do you know fantastic. what? I'd, I'd, uh, I was just going to say something. Just sitting here listening to you talk, right? I'm not blowing smoke. And smoked, rap. And rap. You and know. rap. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Man, many <laughs> no, but just not, not blowing smoke up you or anything. But the passion that you, you project when you talk about that is somebody who is absolutely 100% coming from a place Maybe you're smelling his chemo cigarettes. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm picking up. <laughs> it's that. Do, 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 do. Yeah, Again, yeah. no, but it's coming from a place of experience. You yeah, know, really so I'll just is, say, yeah. while somebody might be listening to this or watching this or whatever, what you are projecting in, in the way that you're doing this, it yeah. is, it's an experience-based thing, yeah, you know? Yeah, 100%. So, so that, that in taking your experience, uh, that, that being the case, I have a fearful dog. I myself project fear as a result, you know, because I, I'm unable to control it. What can I do? You can decompress the dog, allow the dog to calm down in its own environment, in the environment where you want that dog to feel safe and secure. You can create them, isolate them, let them calm down, and you can take the small baby steps to inoculate the stress that you're feeling whilst that dog is calming down and decompressing. That's two birds with one stone. I mean, we focused a lot on fear with this, but there's that point about happiness as well. Yeah. And just as a final one, there's something about when you're training your dog to recall, for example. Yeah. Um, one constant conversation I was having with Mike is he would shout, come, as if it was like, I'm telling you off. And the no. dogs would be like, no, that's not happening. Whereas if you're doing it with excitement, yeah. then the dog's more likely to come I to you. Because this, it's I have this conversation so uh, many times with clients who said, you watch me on social media, the badass catching the bite work dogs. Oh, look at him. But you see me on a field with the dog I'm training and I'm like, Whoa! I was yeah. just about to say. You've got to do it. Yeah, 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 you've got to do it. That sort yeah. of thing. Got to, it I've draws me in. And he's like, he's getting cross because the dog's not coming back. I'm like, well, of course it's not coming back. Yeah. You're shouting. You've got to be happy. Yeah. Move, yeah. move, yeah. move, yeah. move. Yeah. Engaging, engaging, engaging. If you tell me to come like that, I'm going to be like, no. I love it. That's one of my favourite teaching points when I'm working with people with the dogs. When And I find, you know, there is differences in genders where you know where some are going to struggle or not. And women are brilliant at this stuff. As soon as I say recall a dog and be happy, I don't have to say anything else. Come, come, blah, 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 blah. I yeah. say to the fellas like, come on, come, come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't want to do it. Yeah. And I say, whether you like it or not, you need to build a condition response that getting to us is a fantastic thing to do. It's a great subject, isn't it? Talk but about it forever. Yeah, we really could. could. We really could. Well, you've got some great listeners' questions in on this topic. So, Jamie. Yeah, we have. All right, let's go with it. First one, question one. My dog grew up in... <sighs> Deary me, deary <laughs> me. Thank you for sending this one in. You're an absolute diamond. My dog grew up in a house with three cats. She uses the cat flap and licks herself clean. Is this normal for a dog? Well, Is that yeah. normal? First of all, your English Mastiff's quite the contortionist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got really big cats. I, I saw the cat that used to bring seagulls into yeah. the cat flap. I don't understand the correlation between it uses the cat flap and licks itself. Like, is that... Uh, because cats lick the themselves. Cat. Cats lick no, themselves. The, yeah, but the dog... But the so dogs do dogs. Do is it yeah. mimicry? Yeah, yeah but is, is it, it because of the cat flap? Or is he just licking himself? <laughs> I don't know. Does it we catch itself on the cat flap coming yeah. in? Thing? Is it yeah. only it's when it uses the cat bit. flap that it? Yeah, licks that's itself. it. I think we need a bit more. Maybe that. it's the fact that grew up. I'm, My dog I'm grew up in a house with, with, with as he three mimicking cat. the behaviour. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, maybe, I'm, yeah. I'm becoming part. Well, uh, oh, we've, it's, we've it's whether they lick themselves clean. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Not just generally yeah. licking so it's themselves. Well, I would say I would say that you know through his associative learning, dog dogs do they're predominantly associative learners, aren't they? But they do have the ability to mimic behaviour and learn from observation, don't yeah. they? So chances are he's using the flap to begin with because he has seen the cats do it and it's a way of getting in and out. But I think a nice way of looking at a, a, a nice way of sort of like without, you know, in any way ridiculing the person who's posed, posed the question because there is, you know, logic in it too. You look yeah. at livestock guarding dogs. 
livestock garden dogs from a young age are brought up amongst yeah, livestock, livestock yeah. animals so that they see themselves yeah, as being yeah, a member of that yeah, yeah. a member of that species and a you know protector of that species yeah. and things like that is that possible happening with cats you know to, yeah. to grow Absol with cats Ab absolutely absolutely, absolutely no. yeah absolutely i mean he's got to come unstuck if he's starting to try and climb a tree but <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah what's the next okay one? question two is it true that dogs can smell certain medical conditions. Absolutely, 100%. Well, yeah. they could 100%. in the car when Danny did what he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just bullshit, <laughs> Vile medical yeah. condition. Yeah, uh, conditions. Yeah, it is, isn't yeah. it? It is. We, we, we yeah. know this. Yeah. Well, you'll know yeah. when you give a little sneeze and a paw comes with a tissue over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think... Oh, wouldn't that be great yeah, if, be when amazing, you've got, like, if you've got a cold and your dog just kind of like brings you some Lemsip, makes you a little bit of tea, <laughs> yeah, brings yeah. you some tissues. There you go, stay, stay, yeah. stay. Daytime telly on. Yeah. Yeah. You watch Lou swimming. You watch Lou swimming there. Yeah. In a minute with a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vicks. <laughs> oh. But I, I think it's... Um, you know, like I said, we, we, we know that. You know, that, they can that's smell not... cancers. They can they can yeah. smell um, seizures coming on. They can smell diabetes. They can yeah. low blood sugar. They yeah. can smell a lot of um, things. There was some training done with dogs to to detect COVID as well. At one yeah, point. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. COVID dogs. But I think it's uh, it's important as well to you know they might be able to detect it. Yeah. Uh, do I know that it's a sort of like potentially, you know... Um, they have uh, to be trained. Uh, dogs that are able to detect scents that are, you know, uh, absolutely um, yeah. the result of certain conditions. Do the dogs know that those conditions are potentially life-threatening, critical or things like that? Are they acting empathetically towards the fear that it, you know, or the danger that it represents towards the person? Yeah. We don't allow them that much, do we? You know, yeah. we go on and we do it in an instrumental learning way. Smell the smell, get the rewards. Dog, dogs, you know, dogs can find dogs have found um, I can't remember the depths whether it was 6 metres or 12 metres but dogs dogs have smelled small substances underwater wow. from like 6 to 12 metres and you can detect on it you know they're phenomenal they're absolutely phenomenal they're incredible great questions though listeners thank you so much thank you, yeah, thank you. Yeah. we want more though we always want more so how can people get in touch Jamie well if you'd like to get in touch you can always find us quite simply at Dog Scholar Podcast on social media or if you want to email us then podcast at thedogscholar.com Yes, please send them in along with your X. And talking of X, we've got two brilliant ones. Yeah, what we've got we a couple got? of X here. We've got John from Placentia, California. <laughs> we're going across the Atlantic. We're transatlantic people. Sounds like a nutritious Love it. place. Yeah. Isn't it? Oh, this, you this can egg, eat it. This I'm egg, not. I, 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 you're guilty of this, Sab. I've seen this what before. What have I done now? When people let their dogs lick their mouths. Yeah, I do all the time. Yeah. I don't get, it's not gross if it's your own dog. Well, Sorry. I don't know if he's licking his ass. It's the same sort of thing. Well, if it's his own ass, yeah. I don't care. Depends yeah. what comes out of your mouth. You yeah, really yeah, can't differentiate. Yeah. <laughs> licking your mouth, <laughs> licking his ass. I'm a Newport girl. Yeah. I'm fine with it. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's more muck comes yeah. out of that than there is this. Um, I, can't, I can't really add, add, add to that in something, but I know there is a there is a host of um, bacteria that dogs carry and they can cause all sorts of scabs and stuff in your mouth. I, I think there's... I'm going to... Yes, I'm going to put careful. my hand up and fess up here and I don't let my dogs lick my mouth yeah. but I'll kiss my dogs I kiss yeah. my dogs I, mean? I so, think and, and, every and, yeah, true and if dog I say get in and give you, a, give you a kiss yeah. on the side so of your face so am I taking it too far with tongues <laughs> yeah probably, probably yeah probably, probably yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sort of, you've got to ask yourself yeah it's got to be some social bonding you know, we're, we're, we're all a bit icky on this table apparently yeah I think we're alright with it we've got another one and we're flying across the Atlantic again um, Kerry from Cut and Shoot, Texas. What a place to live. <laughs> Cut and Shoot. I want to move there. <laughs> In that, boss, where'd you live? Cut and Shoot. You'd have to do like a hand signal, wouldn't it? Cut and Shoot. Sounds like cowboy. That's where I'm yeah. Texas. Texas, Whoa, yeah. It sounds brilliant. like a Texas place. Texas, yeah. right? This is in, rela in um, relation to behaviour. When someone says... I've Doing had... a Texan accent, please. I haven't got no Texas accent. Can't do that. No. <laughs> if you live in cut and shoot, Texas, I only speak to Jonas cool Black, and he doesn't really sound like he's from Texas. Oh, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> he's from Arizona. Yeah. No, he's from Texas. He? Yeah, he's, he's from, from Texas. Oh, go mad at that. We oh, can't hear that, oh, oh. right? Is she? So Kerry says in relation to behaviour, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna start with this one because this, on. this does my head in, right? No, it's okay. I've had dogs my whole life. Listen, I've had a fridge my whole life, but if it broke, I couldn't fix it. Mm. It means nothing. It means I've had nothing. I've teeth my whole life, yeah. but it doesn't make me a dentist. Yeah, yeah, you know? it means nothing. I think there's plenty of, plenty of yeah. things that we could talk about yeah. with, you know. If you've had, like, you know, let's say you're, you're 30 years of age, you've had a dog since you were a kid, and you've got, what, that's three dogs your whole yeah. life. Yeah. You've yeah. got a data pool of three. We're dealing with, you know, over, over 10 years, you're talking. 
nearly 10,000 dogs, right. you know what I mean? It's not the same. Yeah. Great I feel it's for them. I feel for them. It's. That's all we got time for this week. But if you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with a friend. Because if they don't enjoy it, maybe the dog will. And finally, over to Danny again for a final thought. So, can dogs smell fear? Who knows? <laughs> that was awful. See you next week. Yeah. <laughs>